Hello and welcome to Show Studios Couture Roundup. I'm editor Hattie Malik. Um, and yeah, we're going to be talking about all the wonderful couture shows. Couture is to be kind of officially on the haute couture schedule and to be deemed couture by the kind of Federation and Syndicale de Haute Couture. Got to follow a whole set of rules and meet a set of requirements. Kind of everything from having been based in Paris to having an atelier in Paris where you make the clothes to how many people, like a minimum of how many kind of um, petit mat and cross people you employ. Um, there's a whole kind of roster of things. But the key thing to really be thinking about when we're talking about couture is that this is kind of this one amazing area of industry and craft that really still relies on the hand, things being handmade, um, things being custom, having this very intimate relationship between client and between craftsperson. And yes, that is for an, um, an incredibly large sum of money um, to buy these things. And it's for a very specific and small clientele and percentage of people in the world. But what I love about couture is that it's so much about the actual, the, the heights that fashion can go to, that, that storytelling can go to through clothing, that it is something that actually visually, especially in the visual culture that we live in, people can ac access and enjoy from afar. And I think that in the era of fashion being the most accessible it's ever been, um, there's a slight, there's a kind of interesting twist to actually couture perhaps being the one that we can all enjoy through just visually seeing it and it's definitely a form of theatrics, of entertainment and um, it's this ultimate showing of kind of craft and storytelling, you know, haute couture literally means high dressmaking, it's fashion at its highest and greatest form um, and this season, this spring summer 24 season um, it was really about this high fantasy and storytelling, but then on the flip side, we also had absolute, the absolute opposite. What does couture means? What does couture mean in the sense of reality, of real clothing? Um, but let's start from the fantasy end because Scaparelli open at Couture Week, and this is definitely the show that I'm always really looking forward to because you really hear audible gasps in the audience. It really does take your breath away. It's this almost in unhuman and um, otherworldly form of um, dressmaking. Um, Daniel Rosebury, since he's been there since 2019, off the top of my head, I think it is, um, has really brought Scaparelli, um, which was founded in the 30s, back into the public consciousness, both in ready to wear and in couture. Um, and, you know, I've mentioned the idea of this being otherworldly because of the kind of I think both the surrealist kind of motifs that run throughout the, the house of Scaparelli, but also the kind of out of this world, literally forms that Daniel creates, you know, it is this otherworldly brand. Um, and this season, Daniel was literally referencing that idea of kind of alien Martian forms. And um, the, the collection itself was called Scaparellian. Um, Daniel was thinking about Elsa Scaparelli, the founder, about her uncle who worked in Milan in Brera um, at the observatory. And he kind of, it was because of him that the term Martian was kind of formed uh, when he sort of kind of observed the surface of Mars. Um, so Daniel was thinking about these kind of heritage roots of Scaparelli, this otherworldliness, this, these quite literal Martian references. But then what was really nice in this collection was actually it had a lot of Daniel in it. So it had these alien-esque kind of post, kind of futurist ideas in it. But then also a lot of Daniel and his Texas roots. Elsa was kind of, it was nice this season because we moved... It was, I thought it was clever, Daniel moved away from these kind of projected sculptural gold forms which have really been playing with the codes of Elsa Scaparelli, so the keyhole um, kind of ideas of kind of the sun, all these kind of forms were then taken in and hidden within the clothes, kind of like little easter eggs and instead this focus was on the idea of the kind of form and also on kind of Daniel putting a bit of kind of Texas injections into this and I don't think you can fault this collection in terms of how personal and fun and absolutely beautiful um, 
beautiful it is and I love that Daniel every season really sets a precedent for his ready to work with this kind of these amazing oak couture forms which are so out of this world but then we see them trickle through down to the ready to wear um, and you know when you're just looking on your phone even at these clothes I was lucky enough to be at the show but actually when you look at these clothes you can still enjoy them as well you know everything from these beautiful beaded kind of um, Midwestern kind of bandanas done as skirts through to the viral robot that Maggie Mora was the kind of robot baby that Maggie Mora was carrying through to the kind of robotic motherboard dress which was made all from tech tech kind of motherboards phones pre-2007 Daniel was talking about how you know the tech and the modernity from kind of that he's grown up with is now kind of antiquated um so playing with these ideas of kind of the martian the futurist the otherworldly um but then how kind of even now we're in such a modern time in comparison to kind of 10 20 years ago as i mentioned with couture it's really the the workshops and the craftspeople that shine through that's that's, that's what couture is at its best is when you can really see the absolute skill of dressmaking um in my opinion let's move on to chanel because chanel is such a big proponent of supporting craft they've got so many kind of their metiers to arts their workshops around paris from france and they really support kind of the industry of couture and the industry of fashion at large and so of course their couture show is always um kind of a massive spectacle of that um, I loved this show. Um, it opened with Margaret Qualley, the actress, um, and it kind of set the tone for this youthful kind of playful girl. Um, Margaret kind of was had a very cheeky smile that she kept kind of kind of giving to the audience as she walked round, which set this really nice opening and tone for this collection. Um, she opened in the kind of classic Chanel tweed jacket, but then with this Elizabethan ruff around her neck. And then the skirt had this kind of translucency, which also ran throughout this collection, this delicacy. So this kind of um, sheer kind of skirt layered over these white tights, which had this sheen to them when you looked up close, almost like ballet tights, styled with these black sandal pumps, which all the models wore throughout this collection. A lot of this kind of ballet underlayer ran through a lot of the looks. Sometimes that was actually to the detriment of them because in one of the looks, one of the bralettes was kind of slipping off, which is a shame when you have those moments which kind of break the spell of couture. And I didn't love the black sandal against the white. However, aside from those being nitpicky about that, this was actually one of my favourite Chanel collections by Virginie Viard. It really brought together, as I say, that kind of playfulness, but also that idea of, you know, Chanel is very much a family brand. It's about the grandma, the mother, the daughter as well. Every kind of woman of every age, they look chic, they look amazing in Chanel. And throughout this collection, we had kind of those tweed suit jackets, but then we had them with skirts and they'd be kind of, some of them would be cropped to reveal the midriff, but then the midriff had this kind of white lycra kind of bodysuit underneath which I think was a clever styling choice compared to other seasons where perhaps um, it's felt too forced in a youthful way, but this felt kind of, this still had a kind of elegance to it. Um, I'm just looking at some of the pictures on my phone here. Um, one of my favorite looks was look 10, which is this kind of mint chalk chip green and the jacket is kind of made into this almost cape-like form. Amelia Gray's look again with this kind of, the Elizabethan ruff becomes this upturned kind of ruff around the neck with this kind of poof sleeved, beautiful kind of riff on the tweed through different fabrications, through lighter fabrications. Um, a lot of kind of metallic threads ran throughout this collection, which was kind of defined by whites, kind of pastel colors. And um, there was definitely a lightness, you know, as these models are walking on this carpeted floor. Um, I just loved this collection. I thought it was a really nice mix of kind of the timelessness of Chanel silhouettes, like the jacket but then made a bit more fun with kind of these brocade numbers, look 41, this kind of pink kind of poof skirt with little jacket. You've got your more kind of extravagant kind of embroidered pieces, really kind of speaking to that specific couture client. Um, but it was, it was a very kind of sweet and nice collection. And you know, although maybe that spell was broken sometimes by those styling choices and things slipping, which is kind of a problem, which sometimes I have with Chanel kind of season upon season, I just don't think that necessarily matters all that much because Chanel is this family brand, as I mentioned, the bags, the shoes, the suits are always going to sell. They're always going to be a classic for all ages. And, you know, perhaps 
we miss people miss perhaps you know that spectacle of the Carl era you know when I was talking about Scaparelli that people can access these shows from outside of them perhaps you know we don't have the kind of supermarket shows the big spacecraft shows but maybe this is maybe what's nice about Virginia Chanel is that it's it's more of kind of maybe it feels more like a female perspective in terms of that away from the spectacle when you pull that back that you have have the clothes and that you know Chanel's DNA is always going to stay the same so it's about just kind of tweaking that and playing with that but overall yeah one of my favorite Chanel collections I want to talk about Jean-Paul Gaultier next and our beloved Simone Rocha from the London schedule Simone is is an Irish designer Irish Chinese designer and she is kind of one of many designers now to kind of take take to Jean-Paul Gaultier's couture archive and since 2019 he's kind of handed or 2020 he's handed over the baton to guest designers um, and this aside from the Glenn Martins collection which was definitely um, a standout this is my favourite Jean-Paul Gaultier takes today because it really felt like Simone it felt like the woman's world and it felt like she perfectly balanced using a couture atelier to to the best of her ability to build upon the Simone Rocha world to expand it out you know Simone is so about fabrications and embroidery and touch and feeling and so is couture and it was an opportunity to just maximize on that in terms of the Simone Rocha world but also with obviously respect to the Jean-Paul Gaultier archives and to thinking about how do you merge those two brands and worlds together and I think she did that so kind of seamlessly you know Simone Rocha the woman the woman herself but also the woman that the Simone Rocha brand represents didn't shrink within the kind of huge legacy of Jean-Paul Gaultier and um, clever highlights within this collection were you know yes she pulled on kind of the Marinier kind of Gaultier sailor stripe but she did that through bows a kind of Simone Rocha staple this dress with kind of paneers built into the side was inspired by the costumes that Gaultier did for Le Defeal, which is a film, um, a dance film from 1985, but then infused with Simone, um, Irish crochet coated in silver. Also thinking about fabrics in this collection, we had Irish, vintage Irish lace coated in silver. Um, the models wore little sailor hats. Simone's kind of iconic PVC heels from I think it was her graduate collection one of her earliest ones here with a huge heel like almost a stripper heel take on the Simone kind of perspex heel and then with a little silver kind of a silver pearl kind of toe ring for the toe to go into you think of the Gaultier cone bras these were done but then in kind of little devils this kind of cheekiness that Simone definitely has and this intelligent cheekiness that I think the Simone Rocha has underpinning these kind of dresses and these clothes and definitely the cheekiness of the Gaultier world and it felt like those two mixed perfectly together um, and little moments like these devil cone bras like the little toe rings on the shoes and um, corsetry taken from the Jean-Paul Gaultier archives but then used to give this tension to kind of you know you think of the corsets and these perhaps tightening but then these explosions of kind of huge kind of taffeta gowns sheer organza gowns as well the delicacy and the intricacy of fabrications like lace and crochet but this kind of i think that's what simone does so well and her woman does so well she's delicate and feminine but she's also really really strong like throughout this collection there was that interplay of explosion and pulling back of opacity and translucency in fabrications um, and it was really exciting to see Jean-Paul Gaultier's archive brought alive not copy and pasted and for it also to feel like it was an evolution for Simone Rocha this you know she said that this is kind of a collection that she's seeing as a kind of sisterhood almost to the collection that she previously showed and then the one that's coming up in February on the London schedule um, and yeah it's just lovely to see a designer that works with craft so much be given the keys to a couture atelier for the first time and to see what they do um, and Simone just did a fantastic job and I could not fault this if I tried and if I wasn't biased um, as being a huge Simone Rush fan and um, so congratulations Simone and congratulations to the Gaultier kind of team um, who she worked so closely with on this. This season felt like a season also of pulling back um, and the case of Fendi and Kim Jones 
it was pulling back in terms of fine tuning. Um, the opening look was this beautifully simple, but completely not simple to construct, black dress, black strapless dress. And it really set the tone for this idea of refinement and it felt like a very concise collection. We moved away from the kind of block colours and geometric shapes that we've had kind of created through either print or kind of draping in previous collections. This was about clean lines and beautiful shape, whether that's that opening dress or beautifully cinched jackets with padded hips worn with magpie kind of, this is a magpie collection, kind of this paired with these skirts that kind of glisten and have this lovely kind of sound as they walk down the runway. Um, fabrics later in this collection almost made to look like fur, you know, Fendi is a fur house. It's always been about, like at the core of this house, especially in the women's, it's about texture, it's about colour, it's about a play with surface. This collection had so much of that from those kind of shimmering paillette kind of sequin skirts through to kind of this big, almost kind of creamy brown jacket, which imitated the idea of kind of bird feathers or even fur in other places, beautiful croc effect jackets. This was really exciting to see Kim and me, Fendi Atelier work together on playing with the different effect of kind of different surfaces like this, moving away from kind of more embroidery and more into kind of trick of the eye with what you can do with fabrics, which was definitely a precedent set by, by Karl Lagerfeld um, at Fendi. And um, it was, this collection in summary was just really beautiful. It was a sense of form, sense of cut, sense of fabrication. Um, the only thing that kind of pulled me out of that was perhaps some of the dresses in the kind of last half of this collection, last kind of quarter of this collection where we had kind of silver, kind of embroidery, almost kind of lame, kind of going in this circular formation down the front of dresses, which kind of pulled me out of the seamless, the seamless kind of ethereal nature of some of this collection. Um, there were pieces in this that you could see working so well in editorial, but also working really well for the couture client, really wearable, but special pieces like those jackets, those skirts, but then you've got your evening dresses, kind of beautiful floating chiffon dresses. Yeah, this collection felt like something you'd want to shoot and do an editorial and have kind of that fantasy, but also that can translate to the reality of that couture client's kind of daily life. And that idea of kind of reality and pulling back that I've mentioned definitely came through in a much more literal sense at Valentino. Pier Paolo was thinking about specifically this idea of couture for reality and um, he kind of played on the idea of the traditional way that couture shows were shown in kind of intimate salons by having this on the Place Vendôme um, in Valentino's kind of grand offices um, so we were all sat on little poofs the car the kind of it's got this purple carpet so the models kind of bouncing through slowly walking from room to room we were each kind of on our seating it said what kind of salon we were in but the clothes themselves were like yes we had these kind of beautiful big taffeta dresses and big poofy skirts again shimmer in this collection kind of what looked like sequin but were actually painted feathers which was kind of incredible you know you had this kind of sequin and beautiful kind of extravagance but really at the basis this was about the everyday reality of what a couture reality real what a couture kind of everyday clothe, clothing might be which is kind of the antithesis of when you think about couture so you know you had kind of a parka hooded jacket but then the trim of that hood was with these feathers but they weren't feathers they were organza made to look like feathers so you do have those beautiful couture level details added to the everyday garment that jacket was then paired with kind of a taffeta ball gown. This all plays into that idea of kind of humanism that Pier Paolo talks about and has been talking about for several seasons, really the kind of humanity and the reality of clothing. Um, and, you know, in this collection, there was a lot of kind of tailoring, tailored pants, mixing those kind of beautiful jackets, coats, you know, some men's looks in here as well, kind of beautiful kind of metallic knitted tops as well peeking out from jackets. All of these things that I'm talking about in these very rich kind of pure colours that Pier Paolo again are very key for him. This collection you had everything from kind of highlighter kind of I always think Pier Paolo has a great eye for kind of highlighter colours whether that's highlighter acidic green or pink or orange mixed with kind of slightly more maturer tones such as 
burgundies, greys that kind of stop this being too kind of erratic, if you will. Um, personally, it's not my personal taste of colour palette, but it's also somewhat, I think, impressive how Pia Paolo has managed to create this language through colour. It's something that we saw him doing at, at Men's last week. He, he loves kind of using colour um, as a way to kind of get you to focus on the actual kind of shapes of the clothes. So this collection, as I say, lots of tailoring, those kind of essentials. It's like, what's those essentials but heightened for that Valentino um, kind of couture client? Um, and, you know, you must assume by seeing these this collection that that's kind of what the Valentino client is responding to and what's doing well at these kind of more reality-based pieces. Elsewhere, kind of pulling back, was Dior. This was actually a really big surprise, I thought, this collection, because similarly to other heritage houses on the schedule, craft and a history of kind of their kind of ateliers and crafts people in the hand specifically embroidery always feels so key to a Dior um, couture collection but actually when we went into the space which is kind of this they will show in the garden at the Musée Rodin um, but it's kind of in true Dior style it's kind of this erected kind of cube which then they transform and usually Maria Grazia Curie gets an artist to transform the space. So this time we had um, 23 block print kind of dresses on the walls, this kind of almost pre-human kind of caveman-esque naivety to how you would engage with kind of a garment in its most basic form, but actually that she came across. Um, it was Maria Grazia, basically, before I get ahead of myself, she was working with this artist, Isabella Ducro, to kind of to use some of her work so she used these 20 i think it's 23 block print dresses which were spread onto the walls around the space so they're kind of gigantic way bigger than even a human being um and they were this art was artwork was actually inspired by isabella went to istanbul and was looking at the outfits that sultans used to wear which were kind of these huge oversized garments um and it was they they impressed their kind of power and status on people by kind of being by the shape and the size of their garments rather than kind of embellishment you know you think of Tudor portraits for instance the amount of embellishment on what Henry VIII was wearing that's how he kind of as well as size it was also the embellishment that showed his richness and his power um, but this is all about size um, and the idea of dimensions and um, and I think when you start digging into this, then you see kind of Maria Grazia Curie's always kind of, there's always something feminist that she likes to kind of investigate through her clothing. So you think about the power of couture as kind of the relationship to the client, to the body. And then you think about these ideas, you know, it's custom. And you think about these ideas of then an oversized garment, what's that relationship to the body and how it's kind of constituting the idea of kind of power and I think that's quite interesting to start thinking about these ideas that you can constitute a female wearer's power not through embellishment and all these traditional things that you kind of associate but actually through shape which is so inherent to the house of Dior if you think about the silhouette the new look and um, talking about silhouette Maria Grazia was specifically looking at the 1953 La Seagal silhouette for this collection so we saw her kind of jumping off that and other archive kind of silhouettes because this collection itself was moving away from embroidery it was about kind of the shape of the clothes also thinking about kind of the ceremony and the beauty of kind of clothes and forms in their most basic shape it was interesting reading the, the press notes talking about Isabella's work who was thinking a lot about fabric her, a lot of her works about fabric and how you know you might get a checked fabric is kind of relegated to the apron in the kitchen and how kind of you can associate both fabric but then also kind of clothing silhouettes with women's kind of roles in a very patriarchal system so there's definitely kind of thinking about taking re really kind of framing what what kind of the adornment of clothing and what silhouette means for women when put in a different context and when you're kind of surprised with all the embellishment taken away um but i do think then on the flip side that's a very conceptual idea and that has to be kind of explained and thought about and i don't necessarily know if those ideas came through when you look at this collection just online but i do think that there's 
what underpins a Dior collection is this sense of the woman, the sense of silhouette and empowerment that really runs through all those archival Dior silhouettes. I do think it was a shame to lose some of the kind of the beautiful sense. I think you lost the sense of the hand in this collection and it failed to kind of bowl me over, which I do think that you do want slightly from a couture collection. Um, you, and you kind of expect it, I think, from a heritage house in couture as well. Um, and I think that that's not necessarily bad, but I think it's surprising and it's, you know, if we compare that to some of the other clothes we've been talking about, it's not necessarily something that you can enjoy from afar. It's something that has to be enjoyed very close up. And again, perhaps that's the point because couture is worn and enjoyed by a very specific few, but that have a very close up relationship to this and will be able to kind of come and come to Dior, decide what they want, change it, um, you know, tweak it to their kind of style and taste. Um, and maybe this is kind of a nice palette cleanser. Maybe it's a fresh board for people to kind of, the clients come and work with. Um, so not my favorite, most exciting Dior collection, but I think it's interesting to, to think about this through the lens of Maria Grazia Curie and to make you kind of question whether kind of the most feminine, beautiful collections from Couture have to actually be about this surface embellishment, what, what's underneath that. So that is kind of the summary for Couture so far. I'm now going to love and leave you and come back to you from this evening because I've got one more show today that I want to talk to you about, which is closing off the Couture shows and that is Mason Margiela by John Galliano. So stay tuned and I will see you um, in nighttime Paris very shortly. Okay, I want you to forget everything that I've just said because the only thing that really matters is that Mesa Margiela show, which I just feel so privileged that I was just able to attend um, and that I'm just leaving. Wow, incredible. That's like everything that you imagine that a fashion show should be. You hear these amazing stories of fashion shows kind of in the 90s and that whole 360 experience of storytelling and incredible clothes this was all of that and so much more um by john galliano um so we were invited to arrive at the pont alexandra bridge in paris um, and we were led down the stairs of the bridge onto the kind of banks of the seine and then there were these strip the street lights were kind of set there were these street lights set up under the bridge kind of they were turned on and we walked into this this kind of what looked like a restaurant bar under the bridge and they'd constructed and set up this entire bar which was kind of covered in a layer of dust as if we'd kind of rediscovered it and it has been untouched since its last kind of party debaucherous party in the 1930s in Paris so you're already feeling this kind of you're in the back streets of Paris the underbelly of Paris the nightlife of Paris and already you're part of this magic we were they were kind of serving drinks um, kind of hot, kind of almost hot toddies. Um, and there are all these kind of wooden, those kind of classic kind of wooden um, bar stools um, and seats, glasses left out with alcohol in, piled high kind of coffee cups, just already in this incredible kind of world, um, drawings sketched onto the walls. They thought of literally everything um, and this so we were sat and we were kind of waiting and then the lights went off came on there was a musical performance and then this film started being screened which was by Brit Lloyd this incredible film and it's the film was all about this kind of these very abstract notions of the pulling the tightening of the corset this struggle between two kind of Margiela characters and figures crisscrossing over Paris at night then down to the Seine and then suddenly you realize that Leon Dame the model and kind of Margiela Muse, who has just kind of tumbled beautifully down the stairs, the, the stone steps to the Seine, is suddenly now part of our world. This is suddenly transitioned from film into real life and he is making his way underneath these street lights, past the people sitting outside, and then he suddenly appears in the doorway to the bar where we are seated and he starts to walk. Walk is definitely not the right word. Pat Boguslawski, who is the choreographer for these shows, just does an incredible job of working with all of these models 
to give them such unique individual characters as they walk, they bend, they strut. Leon was wearing this corset which really cinched him in. That was a theme throughout this collection of models wearing these corsets which was so cinched that it almost created kind of Victorian silhouettes especially on the women. The kind of key reference of this collection is thinking about Brassai, Brassai's photographs in the 1930s, particularly his famous image of Madame Brassai, which was like a madame of a kind of mason clothes prostitute house. And it's this amazing photo of her kind of in a fur coat with this hat, kind of these dark, almost kind of deathly eyes. You think also through that of kind of the Toulouse-Lautrec images, that particular one of that kind of woman with dark eyes I thought of as well. But this idea of Madame Bijou kind of and Brassai and the black and white kind of treatment of these photographs, that idea of Paris at night ran through this collection. So quite literally with these corsets, this kind of 1930s feel to the clothes, to the hair by Duffy. There was also this doll-like nature to a lot of the girls and the boys and the people in this show done by Pat. This kind of doll-like kind of Leia, a friend of mine who's a makeup artist who was there, I was saying to her after, I was like, how did they do that? And she was saying, you know, I think they probably had to put kind of a layer of, of glue or something like that over the face to give it this kind of solid doll-like sheen um, to it, which was just incredible. Um, Others of the models were in goggles, which was inspired by Oppenheimer. But really, you know, what's incredible about this collection and every collection that John does is that it's the clothes. You know, you could set up this whole, you know, world in this made up bar on the Seine. You know, you could have this amazing film and then the clothes could be just clothes, but these are just so much more than that. You just, I've never seen anything like it in the way that John Galliano works with clothing, the kind of, just the absolute kind of language of dress, undress, deconstruction, construction. I, it's really hard to actually put into words kind of the magic of, of what we've just seen. Um, but I can go through some kind of highlights for you. So I've mentioned the corsets and these cinched in waist in terms of silhouette. Some of those opening looks then um, worn kind of over that with these beautiful kind of black um, lace dresses. Um, and this idea of kind of being able to see through something in this inherent lightness was something which ran throughout the collection. Um, I just had a glimpse at the press notes and about two pages of that is filled with different techniques, couture techniques, which the Maison have been developing for over a year as part of this collection. Um, and a lot, one of those, which is called Miltrage, is a new couture technique um, to kind of create, to use kind of um, fabrics such as wool, but make them inherently kind of really lightweight. So like wool pieces in this collection, like since jackets, skirts, trousers, actually are kind of just as light as kind of a silk or a chiffon or an organza. Organza and kind of wool crepe in this collection are really key. Um, but kind of, you know, moving from that lightness, then later into this collection, we had kind of exploding forms, almost if you get the kind of skeleton of those kind of um, cage skirts and pannier, um, kind of the skeletons of a pannier that we had in the early looks and then you turn that inside out and you think about the padding of kind of hip padding and what would happen if you exploded that into jackets used it on hips used it on kind of full jackets and kind of and then cinched it in with that kind of margella top stitch and um, these kind of so you have that difference of cinched in and then exploding forms um la latter half of this collection beautiful kind of fauvist brush stroke almost effect on two kind of organza kind of seam one seam um kind of bodysuits which then were layered under these dresses so it's and then you have the kind of four the margella kind of four cornered white stitch on the back of the neck but then it almost looks like it's on the body and um, that influence also of the fauvist kind of colors was um directly influenced by the dutch artist Kees van dongen um, those kind of blues, oranges, are pure kind of marks. Again, thinking about kind of fauvism, but almost those brushworks which like lead into each other. And um, that's another kind of technique that was developed for this collection called retrograding to kind of give this effect of the material almost rushing into one another, the kind of colours. Um, 
what else in this collection? Amazing kind of, I think there are six styles that John has worked on of shoes with Christian Louboutin um, to kind of do these kind of stiletto heel versions of the iconic tabby boot. Um, one of the most, my favorite in this collection was this kind of bubblegum pink, almost kind of, it looked like suede, but I think it might be kind of faux, kind of hide, something like that. Talking about the tabby boots, amazing kind of almost Mr. Tumnus um, animal hide tabby boots kind of knee high and ankle boot um, and also on kind of the tabby brogues as well there is so much in this collection that I like, could talk about and want to talk about but there's also so much that I just couldn't possibly put into words right now because it is so rich with everything there's no part of this which breaks the storytelling or the world that these characters that John has crafted live within but you know, even looking around at the show, who people that are dressed there, they're so, they take on that character too. This isn't this fantasy of dress that just lives within this amazing world that John and his collaborators create. It's also these clothes which you can, I don't know, they just translate so well that like you can come into this world of 1930s Paris, but then you also want to live in it and it feels so modern and incredible and like no other clothing that you've seen before even though there are these incredible historical references in it and John is just an absolute master of dressmaking and, and so are the kind of entire Margello Atelier it's just honestly astounding and I'm sure there are things that I haven't been able to speak about that are going to come to mind straight after I finish filming this um, but what you must do is just go and watch watch this fashion film, re-watch the show on show studio um, and pour over these looks because this is the kind of fashion show that will go down in the history books and this is the kind of collection that goes down in the history books and it's it's a collection and a show like one that I have never seen before um, and absolutely incredible and blew every other show this season right out the water. That's what that's what couture is and that's what fashion is. It it yeah, speechless. Um so that's me signing off on an absolute high for the couture season. Thank you so much for joining us for all of our coverage and we will see you for Women's Wear in February. Bye.